be in these somewhat unusual circumstances. Um, although I guess for, me, for most of you now, Zooming is a very um, kind of obvious and usual word in your vocabulary. Uh, you'll know I'm going to be talking about um, educational research in the past, which means that I'm relatively new to Zoom. I'm one of these oldies that is technology a bit in, in, uh, in awe of, if I can put it that way. Anyway, welcome. Um, I uh, say a little bit about myself first. I used to be the Dean of uh, Murray House. Uh, I led a number of research projects. I've also been the president of BIRA that I know you're going to be hearing from um, tomorrow. Um, but with, you can look up my biography if you're really interested in the number of publications and editorial boards and all the rest of it. But I'd, I'd really like to get started with my provocation. So the title of my provocation is, should educational researchers get involved in policy making and the reason I've focused on this question is the controversy surrounding the scientific advice currently being offered to ministers tackling the COVID-19 crisis. And indeed the establishment of a so-called independent SAGE separate from the, as it were, official SAGE um, in doubt, in th this has been established the independent age because there were doubts about the very independence of the advice that was being offered. Now, of course, the most obvious limit to or risk to um, getting involved in policy making is a risk to your independence and integrity. However, I think before you, you start running away from policy involvement, it's useful to ask three main questions, and that's what I'm going to focus on now. And uh, I've drawn on my experience of leading the research on the National Debate for Education to help um, illustrate the answers to some of these questions. So first of all, the first question is, how do I understand the political context in which I'm operating? In the case of the National Debate, the Scottish Parliament and the executive as it then was, it wasn't called the Scottish Government then, had been in existence for only three years. And the political climate, I would say, I don't know if there's anybody joining us who can remember this, but was one of great interest and even excitement about how the Parliament would operate. There were a couple of features that signaled a possible move away from the old Westminster business as usual politics. For example, the voting system was designed so that no one political party would get an overall majority. And it was likely that governments would have to uh, form coalitions. Secondly, the chamber was designed as you'll all be well aware in a kind of horseshoe shape rather than the opposing benches that we're used to seeing um, at Westminster. There was a lot of talk about a new politics and a desire to involve a greater proportion of the population in contributing to decision making, especially given the falling participation rate in general elections. So the national debate was an attempt to do this. The, first, the turnout for the first Scottish parliamentary election, for example, was only 58%. And politicians were really worried that people wouldn't take part in the new Scottish democracy, if I can put it that way. So the national debate um, attempted was quite different in a number of ways. First of all, it wasn't a consultation on a specific policy. It was rather a look at what was good about Scottish education, what needed improvement, and there was quite a long time horizon between 2002 when the debate started and what Scottish education should be like in 2013. Uh, there were a whole number of e uh, events organized throughout the country. I think eight, 800 I've got in my notes here and there were over 1,500 responses. 
So my reading of the political context was it was quite benign. I mean, this might have been naive, but that was the way I saw it. A rather different situation when you're in a crisis, and I don't know if Mark Priestley is here today, but I wonder how he felt when he heard John Swinney say that National 5 exams were being abolished because he was next year, because he was following the vice, advice of Professor Priestley. And I would have been a, a slightly um, anxious if that had been me. So if Mark is here, I'd like to hear what he's got to say about that. So that's the first kind of question. How do I understand the political context? The second is, what kind of data will be collected? Who will have access to it? And how free will I be to publish? In the national debate, it was already decided in government that there would be a fairly open-ended questionnaire. And this would be a way of um, keeping uh, not the government not trying overtly, at least, to influence politics or influence um, responses, I, sh I should say. And um, what uh, the Edinburgh team had to do was establish a coding frame uh, for all these open questions and the nature of the questions and the pros and cons of open versus closed questions, all the things that you'll be familiar with, um, was discussed uh, with civil servants. The data um, was uh, made available publicly once it had been um, counted. A survey firm was brought in that was used to handling big data sets to do that. And um, we were free to publish. And indeed, I've cited a paper in research papers in education, for those of you who are interested in more detail about the debate. So again, I thought that was quite a good uh, uh, bulwark against any um, uh, charges of collusion or any perceptions of collusion or being drawn in. And the third question, what will you do if the policy does not follow the evidence from the data? In the national debate, the Scottish executive did consult with me on whether its response to the debate was true, in inverted commas, to the data. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, as I say in the paper that I referenced, this might be seen as a rather transparent attempt to draw me in to supporting the policy, which was developed. But I'm rather inclined to the view that this was a genuine desire to check on whether any key elements emerging from the debate had been missed. As it turned out, the responses to the debate revealed strong support for comprehensive education and the professionalism of teaching of the teaching staff. There were concerns about the curriculum and about the overassessment of pupils, which resulted in time in the establishment of the curriculum review group and curriculum for excellence. If the data had, re had revealed a desire to move away from com comprehensive education, it's intriguing to speculate what the executive response would have been. At this time, under a new Labour government we were in the UK, we're getting the rise of academies and so on, so and a move away from local authority control. So that would have been interesting. Um, an ideological challenge would have been posed to the executive. But it's also important to remember that as researchers, um, we have a responsibility to be true to the data, even if they present uncomfortable reading for those in power. So those are the three questions I, I wanted to ask. And I wanted to end on what is education research for? I'm not going to go into a big philosophical treatise on this, Nicola will be pleased to know. But I would say that most of us are engaged in research because we want to understand how things are and we want to try and make them better. Now, I know what counts as better is contested. And I would say that although researchers should not shy away from being involved in policy making, as long as their eyes are open and they can answer these three questions to their own satisfaction, they should engage in um, trying to influence uh, or not be afraid 
of being engaged in policy related research. Research is only one influence on policy, of course, and researchers need to remember they're not elected politicians or government ministers. But I remember one civil servant saying to me, even if research findings are not adopted, some of them seep into the woodwork so that certain ways of thinking and assumptions become embedded. It is, of course, the job of the researcher to challenge these very assumptions. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. That was great. Thank you. Um, on to you, Ben. Okay, thank you very much. I'm just going to share a couple of images, uh, which I hope you can all see. Um, okay, so uh, my provocation, as it were, is um, that I think we need more research focused on digital technologies if we want to adequately understand educational policy and indeed practice today. Um, so pretty much anybody who's been working in a school or in a university or has been homeschooling their children uh, this year will now have first-hand experience of um, digital technologies and how they've exploded um, in, in education. Now, of course that's only at least partly a product of school and campus closures, um, educational technologies and the use of digital technologies in processes of um, policy making aren't new, um, but they're certainly expanding and evolving um, quickly uh, at the present time. Um, so I think the, the digital is an increasingly important focus for educational research. The little title I've got here, I, I suppose I'm trying to reference two things that I think we should be looking at. One is the kind of the organizational bodies uh, that are now focused on using digital technologies for policy purposes, um, for policy purposes like boosting um, achievement or building skills for employability or um, assessing school performance uh, and so on. But then the second meaning that I'm trying to get at here is the way in which um, students' bodies and their behaviours um, might increasingly be rendered digitally as uh, data traces and then used as data um, for the purposes of policy development and intervention or some kind of practice uh, intervention too. So we could think about the use of large student databases, for example, to generate insights into particular populations of students that are then used um, to design some kind of uh, inter intervention. So this is the idea that uh, the, the student as a digital policy body, the, a datafied subject of policy um, attention that's been compiled from digital uh, traces. Now my sense is that Scottish education has a, a good and long track record of work that sort of built up uh, and developed our expertise and our insights to do this kind of work. So um, at the moment, you know, the, the sort of the centrality of data to education systems is reflected in books like this one, uh, the New World Yearbook of Education, which is just about to come out, I believe. Um, edited by Satiria Grek, who's at Edinburgh, and of course Satiria worked with other colleagues um, at Edinburgh, Jenny Osger and Martin Lawn, some years ago, to develop this whole kind of field of what was called policy sociology. Not the only ones, of course, but but were kind of important sort of members of this kind of first thrust of policy sociology and its evolution over the last couple of decades. This idea of policy sociology was very much focused on kind of critical analysis of the social and historical contexts of the production of policies and all of the actors involved in that and the tensions and the power plays that were involved in the production of policy. Um, and then following that, that out into um, the sort of the situated effects of policy in different uh, locations too. Now that kind of work opened up research on the various different networks that are involved in policy, ideas about network governance and policy mobility that have flowed from that. 
which in turn has opened up an emphasis in the work of many people, including those working um, at a number of Scottish universities, on these kind of actors who promote or work with um, digital technologies as a way of trying to kind of inform or um, participate in policy in, in, in some way. And a key part of that, of course, is the, the development of data systems. So organizations that create big data platforms or generate data are um, increasingly sort of big players in, in education. Um, but my sense is what we also need to focus on are some of the advancing developments in big data uh, and sort of data scientific analyses that are increasingly individualized and kind of personally um, targeted um, and intended to generate actionable insights about individuals. And I just want to give one brief example of something that's exploding and it's a bit of a, an interesting area. And this is the generation of genetic data about students um, as part of um, an emerging field of socio-genomics or social genomics. Um, and some related fields of uh, behavioral uh, genetics. Um, I think this field points to some new and emerging um, intersections of digital tech and policy in interesting ways. So the genetics of education um, is increasingly being presented as a kind of area of potentially policy relevant scientific insight uh, generation. Um, it's a true big data science of education. Um, so we now have studies with samples of a million or more that are then linking DNA differences to uh, things like school attainment and achievement, and even in some cases, um, intelligence. Um, and these are based on really huge, um, huge samples. And at the basis of these kinds of studies is um, the discovery and the study of uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So these are very tiny, tiny differences in the human genome, which in association with one another can shape to a certain degree um, uh, human behavioral traits or phenotypes. So there are no ideas here about there's a kind of a gene for intelligence or there's a gene that's associated with uh, how well you do in hires and so on. But the idea is there are clusters and associations of genes which to some extent um, shape behavioral traits such as how long you spend in school or are associated with um, your uh, achievement level. Now, the only way that this work is possible and the only way that these kinds of um, ideas um, about kind of, you know, um, datifying people in a genetic kind of way, the only way this is possible is because of the creation of vast digital technological systems um, for gathering uh, data about human bodies and analyzing it amongst all of these you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms across very large populations. So what we now have, beginning in, to enter into education and beginning, it's just at the edges of the idea that this could be generating policy relevant insight for education. What we have is a vast kind of infrastructure of bioinformatics technologies, of biobanks where genetic data is stored of algorithms, of data science techniques, which have been ransacked and put to the task of analyzing human bodies and so on. And these vast infrastructures of various interlinked technologies and practices are producing particular ways of understanding human life um, and, and, and understanding particular ways of, um, or particular ways of understanding education in uh, genetic terms that simply wouldn't have been possible uh, without the technologies. Now, some people like Robert Plowman have begun to suggest that what we could actually get from this is what he calls precision education. 
Um, so we could use these kinds of uh, data from polygenic uh, analysis to create individualized and predictive scores to forecast a student's genetic potential and use it for personalized uh, intervention. So I think this illustrates something of the kind of the, the, the emergence of some really uh, complex and perhaps really troubling ways in which digital technologies and digital practices by particular kinds of actors um, can generate insights about students uh, which could be used for certain kinds of policy interventions, uh, controversial ones like precision education. Right, I think I've just got about 30 seconds left. Um, I wrote a paper which tried to suggest ways we might approach this. Um, what I was trying to do in the paper and, you know, maybe this is just a provocation for how, how on earth do we study this kind of stuff. I suggested that maybe we could draw on these insights of policy sociology, which have such a rich history in Scottish, edu in Scottish educational research, and, and, and find some kind of interdisciplinary way forward with what is increasingly being called digital sociology, or the study of the production and the productive effects of digital technologies um, in, in society. So if we are studying the kind of contexts and processes of policy production and education on the one hand and the processes of digital of the production and productivity of digital technologies together then I think we can begin focusing on questions like how are these digital technologies utilized or created to deliver particular policies how are technologies producing new forms of knowledge um, that can inform or support policy? How do some digital technologies function perhaps as kind of shadow policy devices which introduce new agendas um, into education? And finally then, what kind of new sources or forms of knowledge and expertise are then involved in making policy relevant insights that actually shape perhaps how policymakers approach the task of making decisions about education and also how practitioners make decisions about what to do in classrooms. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. That was really interesting. Lots of chat being uh, going through the chat there. I'm trying not to look at that too much because I'm focusing on the panel just now. Hopefully Angela is taking lots of notes there. Um, handing over to you, Isabel. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Nicola. And uh, I have to say, I'm almost uh, frightened uh, out of my life uh, by some of the content there um, from Ben. Um, I've come this afternoon very much as a, as a practitioner and a former head teacher and system leader in the local government and indeed uh, working for national government on a number of projects. And my view is quite a simple one. Educational research in the future should be linked quite clearly to scenario planning and involve a whole range of people. Um, the OECD um, in September of this year published Back to the Future uh, of Education and they present four scenarios for future schooling. But they begin by asking us to close our eyes just for a second and think of something that happened in the past 20 years that we didn't see coming. What would that be for you? Would it be, you know, everything's on your wrist, your smartphone, would it be the pandemic itself, online shopping, or the fact that you can set your, your heating remotely uh, so it's nice and warm when you go home? One thing for sure about the future and that is it takes us by surprise. And maybe that constant change uh, could be the new normal we keep hearing of. As a successful school leader and system leader, I often adopted a different kind of scenario planning uh, when engaging with colleagues and stakeholders. And it was a kind of stop, start more approach. What should we stop doing? What should we do more of? And what should we start doing in terms of improvement and change? And that's the kind of approach I just kind of wanted to do a quick whistle stop to uh, with you this afternoon. So what should we stop doing here in, around Scottish education? What should we do more of, build on success we've had? And what should we start to, to do in terms of research, scenario, planning and experimenting with ex 
exploring future possibilities. So my provocation is based on my experience as a school leader and a systems leader, but also my work at the University of Aberdeen, the Scottish Futures Forum, with the RSA on CFE 2.0 and so on. So firstly, what do we need to stop? Well, I think we need to stop only valuing what we can measure. We have moved from a system which was relatively data poor to one that's data obsessed. Mm -hmm. And for all the data that we collect, we've got no real significant evidence of improvement after 10 years of curricular for excellence about pupil learning. There's an over-reliance of data which is measurable and little cognizance taken of the rich narratives that teachers and parents and pupils can cite as evidence of the progress. And we've still got that exam treadmill and the two-term dash to qualifications in our schools. Um, led by SQA, who have lost the trust of the profession. So we need to stop, you know, the full diet at the end of S4, then the end of S5, then the end of S6 approach. Over 60% of our young people stay on school until the end of S6. We need to find an end of learning system. We need to stop continually adding to the curriculum with nothing taken away. It brings confusion and frustration. But worse, it causes an imbalance between a focus on what to teach and how to deliver quality teaching and learning. There's too little focus on pedagogy. And you talk to any colleagues in a school who've been through inspection in recent times, and they'll tell you that discussions with school inspectors on pedagogy and evidence are marginalised. And that isn't a surprise. If you look at how good is our school for, then only QI 2.3 focuses on learning and teaching and assessments thrown in there too. So this has resulted in less than 10% of the quality indicators focusing on pedagogy. And we need to stop the pull to the centre. The size of Scotland as a country should provide an optimum education system in terms of communication, flexibility and responsiveness. But it doesn't feel that way. It feels too cluttered. There are too many layers. We have an accountability culture and a hierarchical structure. It stifles much in Scottish education. Look at the example of skill, something close to my heart, sucked into the centre. Current structure with the Scottish Government, the Scottish Government Learning Directorate, Education Scotland, SQA, the RECs, local authorities and schools, over-governed and too complex. And that forces power and influence upwards and therefore centralised. So what should we do more of? Because everything's not wrong and we need to build on success and build on things we know from the past. Um, it's important that you don't throw the baby out of the bathwater when it comes to any kind of future planning or uh, scenario planning for a future system. So we do need more collaboration. We need more flexibility and we need more trust in our teachers. We need more time for teachers to work together and collaborate for strong links between schools and other agencies to have a positive impact on outcomes for pupils. We need more trust in teachers to enhance their professionalism. And I think that means more support for teachers through multiple learning pathways. While leadership is important, there are other equally as important pathways, such as coaching and mentoring, pedagogy, that would enhance professionalism and assist in integrating professional development with improvement. So we need more of these pathways to be developed and accessible to all. We need more flexibility in the way we teach, more flexibility in the way our young people learn, and more flexibility about who can be involved in that teaching and learning process. There needs to be more of a focus on pedagogy and interdisciplinary learning. Maybe that could be linked to blended learning models as a result of the coronavirus. And blended learning, I think, could be with us for some time. But that will take more investment in time, more investment in resource, more investment in skill development. And a blended learning approach will require more digital literacy on the part of teachers and children and access to first class hardware and software. But a blended learning model with interdisciplinarity built in will embrace learning rather than schooling. And we undoubtedly need 
more voices and more agents of change in the system. Our system is conservative and it's compliant. And although we have significant policy themes, they feel tokenistic. There's a common frustration and people across the profession openly talk about the walled garden in Scottish education. So while policy and significant current themes talk of empowerment and agency and practitioner panels, membership feels exclusive to many. And there seems to be a kind of dominance over a leadership class put in the know to the exclusion of others. So what should we then start to do in this stop start uh, model? So, well, I think if we're looking for a system fit for the next quarter of the, of the 21st century, then we need to start by abandoning the industrial model of education, that age and stage approach to schooling and learning. We could start to experiment with a recalibrated system as detailed in the Scottish Future Forum's report on schooling, education and learning for 2030. You know, we could have a kindergarten stage age three to eight, a gen ed from eight to 15, with a senior phase from 16 to 21. We need to start to explore alternative approaches, we need alternative approaches and flexibility in the system. Do we really believe that nine to three, uh, Monday to Friday is, is still relevant and current and will continue to be relevant and current as we move further into the 21st century? Is the school week and the school day as we currently know it outmoded? Is there a need to move to learning hubs? And I think we need to start to widen, start to look at maybe employing what I'm going to call paraprofessionals uh, from community, from business, from the third sector to help deliver aspects of the curriculum. But those could be parts of the curriculum planned by the teacher and these assistants, the paraprofessionals, there's a resource for the teacher to deploy. And that's putting us trust in our teacher and increasing and enhancing and empowering them in their professionalism. The time freed up by the paraprofessional can then be used by the teacher in real professional learning opportunity and collaboration with others. Opportunities in real time and in real settings. And I think we need to start to assess our senior um, students or senior pupils on how well they can engage with complex challenges, how well they can solve complex global issues. Projects such as sustainability, ethics, democracy, undertaken in a project-based approach would insist them that there has to be collaboration with a range of key partners from community and business, the third sector, with higher education. We need to start to look at that interdisciplinarity within the system. That brings with it a need to start to explore new approaches to assessment and examination. We need to measure attainment, but not everything that is valuable can be measured in the traditional way. We need to get smart about how we do it, when we do it, and we need to explore ways of capturing, recording and celebrating achievement. And we can start all this by realigning and slimming down the structures to distribute power and agency. The current model has various strata of accountability, which many believe stifle empowerment and agency at classroom and school level. So I believe that the future for educational research is around scenario planning, and we should start that scenario planning here in Scotland. We should start to develop a small, small number of scenarios, the stories, the narratives about how a future Scotland might unfold what possibilities could emerge, what problems might we need to overcome, and then we can plan to confront, to adapt, or to embrace as necessary. But that type of planning and that type of um, research cannot be left to the academic researcher alone, can't be a solely academic research exercise, and heaven forfend, it would be left to Scottish Government or Education Scotland, but actually it needs a kind of broad church, almost back to where Pamela started. It really needs back almost to that national conversation and a whole range of people involved. But there has to be strong professional voices at its heart. So we need to start to be risk takers. We need to have courage. And those of you who know me won't be surprised to find that I'm going to finish it with a quote from John Henry Newman. 
Nothing would be done at all if one waited until one could do it so well that no one could find fault with it. That quote from Newman was the tagline that I use as a head teacher in every single document around curriculum for excellence and every single document around change and improvement. And it was permission for teachers in their classrooms to have a go. And I think that's what we need for the future of educational research in Scotland. So in conclusion, my stop, more and start for this afternoon are, we need to talk about learning as opposed to schooling. We need to value learning and attainment and achievement. We need to disrupt the consensus in Scottish education and we need to get together um, to have courage and to take a risk. And I'm really looking forward to finding out what your stop, start more are in the breakout rooms. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. That was great. Three great um, panel provocations. See the links between them all um, and um, what we're thinking about in terms of Scottish education. So I'm going to go straight into the breakout panels. I will, once you're in, sorry, into the breakout rooms, once you're in the breakout rooms, I will put up the questions in the chat. So look out for those coming up in the chat to everybody. Um, and we'll be in the breakout rooms for around about 20 minutes. When you're in there, just in, uh, introduce each other and engage in discussion around the points um, that have been raised from those provocations and using the questions to help you. Um, and then any points or questions you want to raise when we come back in, we can't promise that we'll address them all, but Angela and I will be on the chat. Um, you're also welcome to unmute yourselves to chat as well um, by raising your hand and we'll hopefully engage in some good discussion with the panel. So into our breakout rooms. Um, Uh, okay, off we go and look out for the questions in the chat. And if the panel just want to stay behind just for a moment. Tensioned and soothing rhetoric of politicians that they are now proceeding on the basis of evidence and data, if you look at the structures through which ideas are fed, it's still a highly controlled system. And that ties in with some of the things Isabel was saying about the hierarchical nature of Scottish education. Um, plenty of soothing rhetoric about empowerment and that sort of thing. The system hasn't changed all that much. In my view, Scottish education is still trapped in the iron cage of its own bureaucracy. I'll stop there. Thank you. Do we have a response from the panel? Pamela? Um, I am distressed to hear Walter say that we're, we're not much, we haven't progressed uh, very much. And I can well understand the frustration of um, the bureaucracy that is um, uh, both Walter and Isabel are mentioning seems to be really overpowering for such a small system. I, I understand that. But I think we should, we should still keep trying. Um, one of the, th one of the, th I know that's a bit, bit glib, one of the one of the things I, I mentioned in our discussion was that the uh, breakout room was that most of the discussion is, in fact, almost all the discussion was about empirical research, and we didn't really, I and I could have done this, and I'm sorry I didn't in a way. We should really be talking as well about um, philosophical research and research that is not all different kinds of research that are not um, uh, in, in, empirical. One thing I wanted to mention while I've got the floor is that there have been a couple of very interesting books uh, published recently about challenging the whole notion of meritocracy, um, develop, uh, taking up MFD Young's um, 
condemnation of this as a concept. Michael Sandel has written a very um, nice book, I think, about it, and so has David Butthart. So one of the things um, that we might want to stop doing in Isabel's terms is overvaluing cognition um, as opposed to all the other talents that, that people have that are, that are not um, so easily measured. Um, but how you get that, I throw this back to Walter, how do you get these kind of ideas into the system and how, how do you try and get some kind of influence, bearing in mind that you're not elected, um, although you have, as we've been talking about in our group, expertise that politicians can have. Can Thank I respond you. to that? Yes, Walter, please, and then we'll go to the chat for... Uh, I'll try and be quick. Um, on the question of different types of research, um, philosophical, historical, um, I should have mentioned that in that research strategy document that came out from Scottish Government in 2017, there is absolutely no interest in that kind of research. It's very quantitative and um, sort of a practical with direct policy implications. That's the kind of research they're interested in. And I'm particularly concerned that historical research is not as strong in Scotland as it should be, because we need to know how we've arrived at this situation. Um, it's not easy to, uh, you know, make the points that I think we probably want to make, but that's why, I mean, I suppose my career, um, if I can use that term, um, is, is an example of what a little disruption might achieve. I think the academic community has been too polite. It's been too compliant. It's been too cooperative with the traditional agencies of Scottish education. And I would like to see a bit more robustness in the kind of dialogue that takes place. And we're not going to get it in advance of the um, election to the Scottish Parliament in May next year. But I think, and, and partly because the priority quite rightly is on dealing with the COVID crisis. But I would see a longer term objective to try and recalibrate the kind of dialogue that takes place between the academic community and policymakers and uh, senior officials in bodies like SQA and um, Education Scotland. And that will take courage and it will carry risks. But what are the alternatives? Do we just continue as before? Thank oh. you. Thank you, Walter and Pamela. And good points there and good food for thought. I see your hand raised, Laura, and I'll come back to you. I'd like to just go to the chat, Angela. Is there any points in there to raise um, before we go back to the floor? Uh, yep, there's two points that are kind of related. Um, we've got Neil, and Neil's mentioned about guerrilla researchers. And we've also had Ronnie who's mentioned about teacher-based research. So I think it may be worthwhile unpacking Neil's comment a wee bit further before we move on to Ronnie. Um, Neil, I don't know if you want to elaborate a wee bit and pose this to the panel. Thanks, Angela. Um, yes, I'm oh, sorry, yeah. Neil, after you, on you go. Yes, I'd just like to say um, I've been, I was a practitioner, head teacher, class committed for a decade and a half, 10 years before that as a teacher did so much practitioner research. I just want to echo my agreement with Walter and the real, I really agreed with, with what Isabel said. We've got a sort of conceptual prison and the conceptual prison is HMI, how good is a score and the quality indicators and the six point scale. If you don't work in that prison, you're not, what you do is unexisted. And I actually had to leave because of it. So I just want to pitch out there what's going on in the wider world is so far greater than what is happening here. And we've got the digital explosion and the new ways that meaning are being created. So in a sense that, 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 that my pitch is that we need to have a completely new democratic relationship between the profession, academia, policymakers, government, and restructure power relations much more fluidly. That's my little bit. And my article's on the chat. 
Thank you, and good point that builds on what was said before. Um, do you want to go to Ronnie there, Angela, and then to Laura, and then I see Keith's hand up would be the next one. So Ronnie, do you want to come in there? Yes, yeah, so the point I made was basically um, as I've worked in two local authorities before I retired, and one of the uh, very important aspects of the work of the GTCS in Scotland was uh, the Professional Recognition Award that practitioners received quite often for um, doing small-scale research at school or classroom level. And that research, okay, it wasn't, you know, carried out by serious researchers, uh, many of them here tonight, but uh, it was research that I think could be very useful to fellow practitioners. But although they received the recognition, it, it just seems to me that we've got that body of work that is lost. You know, it's, I, I don't think it was published by the GTCS. Um, and I think it's something we should tap into uh, because if, if research is going, well, one of the purposes of research, I think, should be to improve the quality of education and to help uh, practitioners in the classroom uh, do their job better. And we've got this body of work. I think the GTCS professional recognition has been going for six, seven years. So there's a lot of information there that would be useful for practitioners that just seems to be sitting there. That's all. Thank, thank <laughs> you. Right, yeah, it's a, it's a valid point and it builds on what the, the discussion we've had, we've been having and emphasising the practitioner and teacher role in that and engaging in research as well. Laura, do you want to come in at this point and then I'll go to Keith. Yeah, I guess my point is uh, related to what has been already said in relation to improving the strength of the democratic dialogue around um, not only Scottish education, but the meaning of research. So what is research for and carried out by whom? And, and does this uh, research activity that we all seem to be getting busy with effectively helps us to get a clarity or greater clarity around the purposes of our teaching? And the purposes of our education. This is what we were discussing in our group. There's plenty of data everywhere. It's sitting and hidden in a practitioner's inquiry, is sitting on databases, is sitting in people's heads. But what is this data for? And uh, should we have a more recurrent and refreshed dialogue around the purposes of education? Something that is timely and something that is recurrent. It's not a discussion we have once and for all, as we can see the, the, the scenario in which we live changes very quickly on a daily basis. So are we able to actually inquire in this timely manner with other people, or do we wait for the data being produced and being published? Because that's a bit of an old fashioned idea of research or something written. And you know, research is also the purpose of ongoing discussion and ongoing critical quest of why we are here. So that's all. It's just reporting from what we were saying in our group. No, oh, thanks, Laura. And yes, I think that builds well. And that's, I think, the point you're raising there about thinking about the, and what Ronnie said about the practitioner well, and what pr practitioners are doing and that research isn't just about being written down, but embedded in practice and informing practice and moving our, our thinking and our practice forwards, I think is important. Keith, do you want to come in there? Great, thank you. Um, my name is Keith Stryber. I'm a researcher at the Scottish Government. Uh, I feel a bit of an interloper, but very glad to be here. Um, and thank you to all the speakers. I think they were all excellent presentations. Um, you can probably hear this Mario Kart going in the background, so apologies if you can hear my kids and my puppy. Um, so um, I was particularly interested in Pamela's presentation and her sort of provocation, should educational researchers get involved in policy making? Um, and absolutely think they should be, um, and that's part of the role of my team is to make sure that researchers are absolutely involved in policy making, and that we do hear, you know, the research and evidence and insights and data that, that come from academic researchers, um, and 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 take up uh, Walter's points, uh, very good points about the research strategy for Scottish education and the reference group. I think they're still a work in progress, um, and you know we're very keen to keep developing the academic uh, reference group, and I think that's. It's been great because I, I think I know about half the people on the call just through that reference group. And um, so I feel that we're breaking down um, barriers between government policymakers and academics, but that's still a work in progress. Um, and I think there was a provocation from Walter at the end as well about being too polite. And then I think a plea is not, not to be too polite. 
um, if you have a good piece of research, come you know batter down our doors and make sure we hear about it. So this was um, encouraging you to make sure that research gets to our door and we have those conversations because I think they're absolutely uh, vital for us to hear. Thank you, Key. Thank you. Um, and good, interesting points coming back there to the points that Walter raised as well. Thank you. The, is there anything else in the chat, Angela, that you want to pull up? And some example that I didn't close it without. from Charlene mentioned about um, GTC that some articles at Teacher Research is actually published in Teaching Scotland magazine. Um, Sarah Strachan has given us some examples on she did a, a GTC work here just supporting a collaborative research paper she worked upon. Um, but actually, can I go back to Neil McClellan because he did mention about guerrilla researchers and I want to give him a chance to speak. So, Neil, do you want to come back in? Thanks, Angela. Neil McLennan. Yes, yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Neil McLennan. Neil McLennan. Yeah, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm just yes, typing up ahead. just now to say, I think Walter's rallying call from earlier is perhaps the most important point for us to take away. I see a few folks nodding at that just now. Walter again leading the charge. We, we, we do need to be more aspirational, more confident. And I, I, I reflected in my own group, um, Chris Husbands, when he was. Um, Director of Institute of Education in London uh, presented a really good paper a number of years ago that I was at where he talked about the, the interface between policy, research and practice. But whilst the three of them need to work in synergy, there does need to be a bit of rough edges between them. They can't all be hand in glove. They can't be um, uh, at the point that they're all sitting in a cosy alliance together. There does need to be rough edges and that's where the rough edges will find the new gems that are going to take us forward. Um, and I think Walter um, has, has just hit the nail on the head there, that we, we do need to, to get more confident, more aspirational. And that's why I've put the note up there about this, this guerrilla research, which fits in with what Ronnie's talking about, getting practitioner research into the system, getting it pushed bottom up, as opposed to the sort of control mechanisms that, that Walter's critiqued so well. Thank you, Neil. I'm going to close by going back to each of the members of the panel. I can see your hand up there, Pamela. So I'll bring you in and then I'll bring in Ben and Isabel just with a final reflection before we finish up the session. Thank you, Neil, for that. Pamela? Thank you. Thanks very much for all these contributions, which are really, really interesting. Why I put my hand up was the, the idea of um, disruptors and um, guerrilla researchers sounds great makes us all feel good i point to dominic cummings as an example of what happens <laughs> when you are too so far outside that you can't get anything done you can't get any cooperation that's all yeah. i wanted to say thank uh, you pamela <laughs> ben have you got a final reflection or point you want to raise well I love this idea about guerrilla researchers getting to market quicker via blogs and so on. And actually, I think there's a really, really powerful role for blogging our research, commenting on things that are actually happening, um, short circuiting the slow timeframes that, that often go with research. But at the same time, there's a there are real dangers about what kinds of forms of authority then, um, you know, that call themselves research end up in the hands of teachers so other people may have seen the paper that was published earlier this year in British Educational Research Journal on teacher populism and this idea that actually you now have various so-called sort of evidence champions and research evidence groups who primarily work through blogging and online conferences and so on but exhibit a particular form of politics and particular approaches to pedagogy um, and in particular reject the expertise of academic research as being completely unrelated to the reality of what happens in schools. So I think we need to be quite careful about ideas about sort of guerrilla um, research, although I, I very much like the term, and about you know, the politics of these different ways of um, engaging or, or doing research and getting it to the public, but also engaging teachers when teachers themselves are perhaps targets for these kinds of attacks on academia, academic research too. 
Thank you, Ben. And finally, Isabel. Uh, thanks very much, Pamela. Uh, Nicola, sorry, I've had, a, I've had a fabulous afternoon. And in many ways, I think Dominic Cummings is the perfect example of why we do need disruptors. Um, but the disruptors uh, as a kind, I, I suppose, disruptor in our very own water is with us this afternoon. Because what seems to me that kind of happens just now, and Dominic Cummings, I think, is an example of this, that in Scotland, we have academics who raise their head above the parapet, who've got something to say, one or two things happen. They get invited in and they get a Scottish government contract, and that's wow. them, or they're sidelined. And, uh, and I'm very much on the side of those who wish to continue to be that strong voice uh, from the sideline. So all for uh, the disruptors. Um, I think that my biggest takeaway from this afternoon is that obviously there's always a place for, um, for research, for educational research. And I think the more often that we can work together so that we have, we have academic research, but added to that, we've also got you know, practitioners and people in classrooms and people who work in other parts uh, of the system can actually come together because by coming together, we actually can make sense of the past. We can identify what currently happens that we want to continue to start to do that serious planning for the future. Thank you, and I hope you will attend the, se the session. I'd just like to thank our panel, um, Pamela Munn, um, Isabel Boyd and Ben Williamson today. I'd like to thank all of the people who are here and have been contributing. Um, I have really enjoyed the session this afternoon. I thought the panel gave me lots of food for thought, couldn't stop taking notes and then great discussion in the breakout rooms. I just would like to remind everybody that um, this is our week of events celebrating the CIRA conference. So um, just so that you're aware, we still have a, two events left on Wednesday. We have our um, international links. Um, so we're looking at educational research, past, present and future with our panel provocations from Dominic Wise, um, John Chrysler and Celine Healy. Um, so really looking forward to that and hopefully that will build on a discussion that started today. And then on Thursday, we're launching our CIRA starting points for educational research in Scotland. Um, and we will be presenting our Estelle Brizard Award for this year to um, Murray Craig. And we also have our CIRA annual general meeting. So we would, it'd be great to see you there. The Eventbrite links are still live. So please click on those to register and uh, to join the events. And finally, if uh, we have a CIRA Connects event coming up in December, um, this is run by the Physical Education Network um, from CIRA, and it builds on an event that was held in June, where it was a panel of um, the deputy heads and heads talking about um, what the implications of COVID-19 on health and well-being. And this is following up on that to see um, the experiences and what hap what's happened um, for them uh, since schools returned in August. If you want to register for the event, the event bright link is there and it will also be on the website. And finally, if you enjoyed the event today, thank you for coming along. And if you're interested in becoming a, a member or would like more information about CIRA, please go to our website, follow us on social media and keep the conversation going after this by using the hashtag CIRACOMP20 um, hashtag. So thank you, everybody. Great conversation. If the panel and any members of the CIRA executive want to remain on at the end, just to say a final thanks um, and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Hopefully to see a number of you on Wednesday as well. Bye-bye.